Well, good morning. Happy Tuesday to all of you. God's richest blessings as we gather together to go through this study on Genesis. It is a beautiful day out day. I don't know if you um, have ever noticed this, but there's certain times of the year like today where the sky is just this rich, deep blue. It's my favorite color. And uh, I just, if you get a chance to, to this time of year, just go outside and see the beautiful sky that's out there. It's a beautiful day to be alive. It's a beautiful day to be in God's creation. And I'm so excited to be with you here on this Tuesday to study Genesis and God's Word. Uh, we are going to adjust. We're in the middle of this lockdown. And because we're in this lockdown, um, we're, we're still, you know, trying to navigate how to get back together, you know, for worship and all sorts of things. But I guess I wanted to show you what's going on at the county level. Uh, so let's just take a brief time this morning and go look and see what the county is doing. Uh, if you go onto their website uh, at the coronavirus website at Pima County, you'll see that the governor has opened things up. Uh, and said businesses can get back together. But even though businesses are getting back together, you still have to uh, maintain social distancing and do the things that we're required to do to stay safe from each other. Uh, this is the chart that they put together. This is the nine criteria that are necessary before we open. And we still have a lot of reds in this first column. This red is we have to have decreasing positive cases over 14 days. This one is sufficient personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. This one is contact tracing and this is uh, testing. And those things aren't ready yet. Once these all move into the green, uh, then I think uh, pretty much the economy can go back to normal normally. But until then, we're still kind of in this transition area. And this is the one we all struggle with because it says uh, for individuals, no groups greater than 10. But then it, over here on the right, it says, that large venues, restaurants uh, begin to operate with appropriate physical distancing. So I guess a church can operate with appropriate physical distancing as long as there's no groups greater than 10. So that's, that's this gray area and some churches are you know trying to uh, figure this out and try to do great things. Our staff is working phenomenally well to try to figure this out and I'm so proud of them. Uh, and we are gonna lay out a plan that you'll all um, uh, be able to see very, very shortly. So um, that is kind of where we are uh, for the present time. And also, uh, we also have this wonderful uh, thing happening on Sunday. Uh, we're going to do this. Um, uh, uh, it's called Community Sunday. But what I'd like you to consider is to be a part of it. Uh, we're going to lay it out on Sunday. But in order to be a part of that, uh, you have to, uh, it is recommended, it's very strongly recommended that you provide information as far as where, um, uh, how you can connect, whether or not you can connect through Facebook, whether or not you can do a Zoom call, all those other things. And so um, I'm putting a link uh, on the website showing where that form is. If you could click on that form and, uh, and get into the system and that way we can see kind of the best way to... Uh, to get you connected for Community Sunday, which is happening this Sunday. All right, so those are the kind of the announcements. Uh, if you're here this morning, you please say hi and uh, let us know that you're here and uh, God's richest blessings on your day. We are studying the book of Genesis. Oh, I should tell you, it's my, my youngest daughter Lydia's birthday today. So I'm so happy, I'm so proud of her. She's wonderful. She's living in Minnesota. And uh, her husband is in the military, going to be deployed here pretty quick. Um, so um, we're, uh, we're just very uh, excited, uh, but also saddened about that. Anyway, happy birthday to my beautiful, beautiful daughter. Uh, so uh, we are in the book of Genesis. And uh, we've spent the last five, six, seven days in Genesis 1 and 2. But today we're leaving Genesis 2. Genesis 2, at the end of Genesis 2, we have a man and woman in the garden uh, with God, uh, with all the food they would need, the, all the, they, they don't need shelter, you know, because it's a temperate temperature in the garden. And um, I guess I, I hate to leave Genesis 2. I mean, we're going to leave Genesis 2, but it's always sad for me to leave Genesis 2 because uh, 
it's this it's this time when mankind you know man and woman living in the garden living in this time where they're where they know that that God is there that he's going to look after their every need uh, it's almost like when you've got a little kid right uh, your child or your grandchild and they're walking between mommy and daddy and they're holding their hands and mommy and daddy are swinging them you know a two-year-old a three-year-old and the the three-year-old all the three-year-old cares about is mommy's there and daddy's there and I'm protected and I'm safe. That's the, uh, there's no other worry in the world. Now, I know that there's temper tantrums and all sorts of things, but you know that feeling I'm talking about. You're at the park uh, and you're pushing your grandchild. You know, you're, at the, you're walking down the street holding on to your grandchild. I mean, all, all the grandchild knows, all the child knows is that life is safe. And life is safe because mommy and dad, daddy are there protecting that child. You know, they're going to lay down their life. They're going to do anything to protect that child. Well, in the Garden of Eden, we have someone protecting uh, us, uh, mankind, and that's the creator of the universe. And so um, there's absolutely nothing to worry about. It's life is good. It's almost this age of innocence, if you will. Um, and I, I just long for that time for that age of innocence. If you've ever had a child, at some point, they they move out of that innocence, right? They, they start growing up and they start learning the challenges of life. They get stress in their life. They worry. Um, you know, mom and dad aren't always uh, able to solve every problem in their life. And, um, you know, they start learning about things that are dangerous and deadly and you know, we want to keep our children in that age of innocence as long as possible, not because we don't want to expose them to the things of life, but it's during that age of innocence where, you know, they grow uh, in, in other ways that, uh, you know, we want to keep that age of innocence just as pos- as long as possible. And one of the things that just distresses me entirely about our society today is, um, you know, we, uh, we want to throw our kids out of innocence just as soon as possible, right? You know, uh, some of the stuff that they teach uh, in our school systems or school systems around the world. I mean, we want to we want to expose them to as much stuff, you know, and to get that innocence because you know innocence is silly, right? But but I I kind of miss innocence. I think I think there's just something sweet and pure and um, wholesome about that time of innocence. Any child that gets you know gets. Um, any child that's in that age of innocence is just a pleasure to watch, and when they and then when they finally grow up and move out of innocence, it's it's always it's heartbreaking to me. Um, if you've ever, it, these are the these are the stories that are told. You know, I, the one story that just comes to my mind is the Sandlot, right? Where they're all the kids in the neighborhood. You know, they have they all gather together and they play baseball on Saturday morning. You know, and they're at the Sandlot and and they're all friends and you know they they go on stuff together and. Um, and they just, they grow up together, you know, and at some point, you know, they lose that innocence, the, they lose that sandlot. And uh, so this is, this is also, um, you know, this is also told in narratives and it's, it's all a reflection of the innocence we lose after we move out of Genesis 2, um, which we're going to do. So we are, we are continuing on, we're going to move into Genesis 3 now. And uh, Genesis 3 is, um, is where... Uh, the fall of man begins to happen. So let's let's start reading into Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Oh, you must. Okay, so you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So, this is uh, this is basically the serpent um, uh, talking to the woman. So, the serpent is now um, 
So this serpent is, um, uh, in, in Hebrew, it's nahash, right? It's, uh, it's from the, the verb nahash, uh, which means to whisper. Uh, it's one of those onomatopoeia words, right? That's uh, whisper, a nahash. You've got the serpent living in the garden. This, um, this idea of the serpent uh, goes back, you know, back to this time, even to the time of the Greeks. Uh, the, the serpent is the whisperer or the divination person, uh, you know, this divination creature. It's, it's represented often by a snake. If you, look at, uh, if you look at early Greek culture, they put the snake on the staff and that represented this special power that, uh, of healing, you know, because you had this divination, you had this connection to God. And I think it's still used um, today where you might see the snake wrapping around the staff that, and you always think, what in the world does that mean? Well, that's this this idea of the snake that has this connection to uh, to the divine or to the divination, right? To this the the otherworldly stuff that's out there. Um, witchcraft is part of this too, right? Uh, it's a connection to the it's a connection to that other power that you can't see, you can't touch, but you know it's out there. Uh, and so that's that's why they put the snake on that herald staff or whatever it is that they have for uh, for medicine. Um, and, uh, so this is the Nahash, uh, the serpent, and he's crafty than any of the wild animals and the Lord God. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the fruit of the garden? Right. And so, um, we, uh, we have this serpent comes up to, to Eve and, and basically how does he get under her skin or how does he get her? to doubt God, right? He, he begins to get her to question whether or not God is truly um, in her best interest, right? Because when you are innocent, uh, when you live in this age of innocence, um, you, you, you just trust God, right? You trust that God is gonna take care of your best interests. And if God is the creator of the universe and he puts you in a garden, you don't have any question. Of course, he's going to take care of your best interest. Uh, and even if he tells you not to do something, it's because it's in your best interest, right? Uh, and, and so the serpent, this whisperer, comes in and says, well, did God really say that? Is God really after your best interest? Uh, and he begins to get Eve to question God. Um, and what does she say? She says, well, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must touch it or you will die. Now, this is interesting because if we go back, I'd started to read this a little bit, but if we go back to look in Genesis 2, verse 16, uh, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, what's interesting here is it doesn't say that you can't touch the fruit, right? God said you can't eat the fruit. That's what he told Adam. Now, remember, that happened before Eve came on the scene. Uh, and so God told Adam, do not eat the fruit. But when God told Eve not to eat the fruit, he put one more restriction on there. He says you can't touch it. Now, there was no prohibition to touching the fruit. Uh, but, but Eve wanted to protect, or Adam wanted to protect Eve, and so what does he do? He says, not only can you not eat it, but you can't even touch it. Uh, and this is, this is a principle that happens over and over and over again throughout history. And it's this principle of adding layers and more layers of restrictions to try to protect from the original restriction. The original, I guess, command by God, if you go back to the beginning, right? There's not even a Ten Commandments yet, but we know that the two commandments are you've got to love God, you've got to love your neighbor. And the reason why you have to love God and love your neighbor is because we are created as social beings with a spirit. And because we're created as social beings with a spirit, uh, we are not complete unless we got love God. We are not complete unless we love our neighbor. Those are, those are things that we need to do in order to be complete human beings. Those laws aren't because God doesn't love us. Those laws are there because God does love us. 
And so uh, even though it's not explicitly, explicitly here, we, we can see throughout Genesis about loving God and loving our neighbor. And, uh, but what happens over time uh, is that more restrictions are put on the commandments, on those laws. Uh, eventually it becomes the Ten Commandments. Eventually it becomes over 600 laws, right? But it all, it's all layers upon layers upon layers to protect us from the root law. And the root law is basically this. Um, don't eat from that tree because uh, then you will lose this age of innocence. You'll lose this connection you have to the creator of the universe. This, this, no, this age of innocence where I just love God. I love God. Um, that kind of goes away. Um, it's interesting. Uh, they're eventually, we're going to see they're going to be kicked out of the garden. And, um, and of course, they lose their innocence. Now they have to fight and they have to work. And all the struggles that we have in the world today are all because of this. And we blame Adam and Eve. But you got to ask yourself, why did God put that tree in the garden? And did God know that at some point that they would um, eat from that tree? And the answer is, of course, yes, because God knows everything. He knows that at some point uh, they, they will lose their innocence and they're going to have to struggle in life. But... The, the thing that I want you to just consider before we move on is um, after they're kicked out of the garden, what changes, right? I mean, does God still love them? The answer is yes. Does God still provide for them? And the answer is yes. Um, is life hard? And the answer is yes, but God still loves them and God still provides for them. Uh, and really, uh, they might, Adam and Eve might you know, sit down in one, at some point and just reflect upon the fact that God is still there and God still loves them, God still cares for them. And in a way, we are still the same way, right? We have all the struggles and the, and the trials and the temptations and the pains and the sufferings of life, but, but God's still there. God still loves us. God still cares for us. Um, and if, if, we, if we sit down uh, in a garden and we, and we spend time with God, uh, just, just reflecting in his presence, we can... Um, understand that God is still there with us and that he still loves us and he still cares for us. There's no, there's no thing on our, what Romans 8, 38, 39, neither life nor death, neither angels nor principalities, things past, things present, nor any other created thing can ever separate us from his love. I mean, we're still there with his love, uh, which is, which is just a phenomenal thing, right? So, um, yeah, so Adam, Adam says to Eve, do not eat and do not touch. Uh, and so he places a little bit of a higher, uh, a higher burden um, on, on Eve to try to protect her so that she has this extra protection from not doing the real thing, which is eating from the fruit, from the tree of knowledge, right? But Eve does eat from the tree of, of knowledge. And, uh, and so... Um, and so it begins, right? And, and she begins to doubt. Adam and Eve then began to doubt. Does God really love them, right? Uh, are the rules that God places in our life really good rules, right? Uh, this, is, this is the root of all sin. The root of all sin is, trust, is not trusting that the, the prohibitions that God put into place are put into place for our benefit, right? Uh, we think that we can outthink God. We think that we can uh, that we can do things that we want to do because God really doesn't know what He's talking about. Uh, I remember I was giving driving lessons to one of my children, and she looked over to me and she said, "Aren't I a great dad, driver, Dad?" <laughs> to which I'm like, "She is so. She's this is her first driving lesson, right?" <laughs> And, and already she thinks that she's got it all down and under control and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I mean, at some level, yeah, she did get the car going forward and it stopped and we didn't die, right? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, in, the, in that respect, nobody died. Yeah, you're a pretty good driver. But driving takes, driving takes reflexes. It takes knowledge. It takes being put in tense situations that aren't necessarily the... You know, you know, how do you deal with them? And, and these are all experiential things. You become a really good driver after you navigate the world for a very long time. And um, you, you grow in your faith 
when you just simply follow God and his commandments and you're not entirely sure why he put these restrictions or prohibitions in place, but at some point and at some time in our life, we realize, okay, they're probably in place for my benefit uh, and, f and so I'm gonna start following these and then you start growing in your faith and you begin to see even retrospectively why God put some of this stuff in our life and it's basically to protect us. And then we become a good driver, right? Then we become a, uh, a human that's more in line with how God created us than what can happen to us if we start following, um, following the world. I was talking to somebody recently uh, and they were telling me some of, the, some of the stuff going on in their family and, uh, and that was, um, you know, it, every family has challenges, right? Um, but every once in a while you run into somebody uh, in your, you know, in your extended family or even that's associated with your family who it's all about, it's all about, you know, it's all about how smart I am or how wealthy I am or what car I drive or what house I live in or what friends I have or what community group I'm in or what things I support, you know, and it's all about, it's all about your image and your presence in the world around you. And when, when you have people like that um, in your life, it's very, very challenging. Uh, and and this, is, this is the impact of the world around you when you don't understand that there is a God who loves you, who created you, who has restrictions because he wants you to live the best life you can possibly live. And, uh, and so we follow God's law, we follow his rules. Uh, we believe that God has our best interests in mind and yeah, sometimes it doesn't make sense to us and sometimes we wanna eat from that tree, uh, but we don't because we know that when we do, uh, we're gonna go down spirals that we don't wanna go down. When I say a spiral, I mean, you know, you, uh, I think when you, when you start, uh, what can happen in your life is that you do something that leads to something else, that leads to something else, and, and pretty soon you get into this spiral that you almost can't even recover from. And it's better just not to go down that path because sometimes those spirals are very, very difficult and it requires a lot of prayer and a lot of help and a lot of people surrounding you to get you down out of those spirals. So um, so now we see Adam and Eve have lost their innocence, right? Um, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So then what happens? Well, we see. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. So um, this is this is the fall, right? This this is at the point where all of our pain and suffering, uh, all of our trials, all our tribulations, it all goes back to this point. The woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and so she said, "I'm not going to listen to God. I'm not going to listen to His prohibitions. I'm going to listen to this." this whisperer, this other force out there that wants me to have all the knowledge and he has my best interests in heart. And so she takes from the, from the fruit of the tree and she eats and her eyes are opened. And she honestly believes now because she hasn't instantaneously died, right? She believes, Adam believes that, hey, this isn't so bad. Now we see, uh, now we have knowledge, now we have wisdom, but it's a false wisdom and it's a false knowledge. Think of it. The creator of the universe has all the power um, and he says, if you want to live the best life, if you want to live in the garden, you can't eat from this tree. I'll take care of everything else. But we always want to believe 
that we are smarter than God. We're more knowledgeable than God. We've got more wisdom than God. And if you think about it, that is the most laughable thing on the face of the earth. We don't have any more wisdom than God. God is, <laughs> we are like, we are like the virus that's on the ant's rear end that's walking on the grass outside my window right here compared to God, right? He has so much more knowledge and understanding about the laws of the universe and how he created us uh, than we could ever, ever, ever possibly understand. And uh, we will see that through time then he starts to give us ways that we should live because we just don't get it. We just don't understand that we are simple creatures of God. We are, we are, we are at our best when we live a life of simplicity. We are at our best when we simply hold on to God's hand and let him swing us and know that we are in his presence, that he loves us, that he cares for us, that nothing can ever you know, separate us from his love. He's still there, um, but their eyes are open. And what's the first thing they do? They realize they're naked, so they sow fig leaves. Um, so part of it is, um, you know, is this an actual naked or is this a metaphorical naked? I mean, when you understand things, now you are exposed to God, right? You understand that your heart is not pure. Uh, you understand that you have broken God's law. They see that they've broken God's law. Uh, and so they sow fig leaves, but they understand that they have failed in the one command that God gave them, which was not to eat from the tree, right? That you had one thing to do uh, and they failed in that one thing. And so God's walking and what do they do? Do they go out to God and say, God, hold my hand, you know, lead me through this. I've, I failed miserably. No, they don't. They hide from God. And we have been hiding from God ever since uh, because we are full of sin we are full, I, we're not, you know, and it's not sin. Um, sin is a very large term. It means missing the mark, but basically it means that we have tried to believe that we understand this world better than God understands this world. We've, we're trying to believe on our own effort and our own skills and our own wisdom and our own power to get through this life. Uh, and we can, we can muddle through this life holding on to our wisdom or our power, our strength or our wealth or our position in society or all these different things. And we have to if we're not going to rely on God. The other thing you can do in this life is simply to just hold on to God's hand and say, God, I don't know how this life's going to work, but I know that you love me and that you care for me and you're going to kind of guide me and protect me through this world. Uh, and he's revealed so much. He revealed through the prophets. He revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. He reveals what it is to be a human living in this world. And it's pretty clear. It's pretty simple. And it's basically leading a life that is like we're in the garden and trusting in God, knowing that he cares for us. Uh, so the Lord God calls out to the man. So God knows that the man's out there hiding. He says, where are you? Um, in the original language of God, it's German. Adam, wo bist du? <laughs> Where are you? Because God, right, is German. Um, no, we, God's, I don't know what language God spoke. But he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And if you go to um, uh, any of the, uh, you know, um, uh, people who did a counseling, you know, uh, Nietzsche or... Um, uh, who, you know, who's the father of, of psychology, you know, I can't remember his name escapes me right now, but he always said the root problem of mankind is fear. Fear of the future, fear of what's going to happen, fear of relationships, fear of everything. It all comes down to fear. Every problem that mankind has all goes down to fear. And this is exactly where it happens. This is where fear enters into your life. It's where fear enters into mankind. I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So Adam hid. So now we are people who now live in fear. We live separated from God. 
Um, we understand that uh, we don't have the wisdom of the world, but we want to try to rely on our own wisdom. And when we do, we fail. And when we fail, you know, we, we hurt people, we hurt relationships. And it all comes back to here. And this saddens me. This is, this is where all the pain and the suffering that you've ever experienced in your life, any, any loss of a relationship or loss of a, of a loved one, a spouse, a child, a, grandchild, a grandparent, a, you know, a pet, um, a loss of a job. Uh, uh, if, you've, if you've ever gone through any struggle or trial or anything in your life, it all comes down to this point. And it, it, is a sad, it is a sad time for the part of humanity. But, you know, we want to think we're better than God. And so we eat from that tree and we believe that we're better than God, that we're smarter than God, we're wiser than God. No, God, God understands the human condition and he knows that we are the bug on the ground. So I think we'll leave here at the fall, Genesis 3, 6 through 10, where we're naked and we hide. Um, thanks for joining me. We get, uh, now there's some consequences from this and they're pretty severe consequences. Um, we'll get in those tomorrow, but... Again, uh, please sign up for Community Sunday coming up this Sunday. Uh, we do have a prayer service coming up tomorrow night at 6.30. Please join us for that if you can. And uh, may God richly bless your day. Uh, we're going to close in prayer. Dear God, um, uh, we are broken people. We are fallen people. Uh, but because we're fallen, that isn't the end of everything. The end of everything is that you still love us. You still care for us. And you even became flesh to dwell among us, to show us your love for us. And for that, we thank you. Watch over us today on this beautiful blue sky day. Keep us ever in your grace until we meet tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that's um, that ends us for Genesis, this part of Genesis 2. And uh, I pray that God richly blesses you and keeps you. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.